For this lecture, we're going to be talking about recognition. And before we get into the meat of this lecture, let's talk about some of the early considerations regarding recognition. Let's start by looking at some failures to recognize certain visual objects. So these are generally classed as agnosias, which are a disturbance in a person's ability to identify familiar objects. And there are multiple different types of agnosia, of which two are presented here. The first is apperceptive agnosia. And this is a disorder involving a failure in object recognition caused by difficulties in assembling parts of an image into an understandable whole. What this means is people who suffer from apperceptive agnosia are able to see individual features around them in the world, that there are certain lines or angles or colors, but they're unable to merge all of these different items together into a singular object. Imagine, for example, if you were looking at a banana and you could recognize that it was yellow and slightly curved and slightly circular in shape, but you could not merge all of them back into a singular item. You could only see those features independently of each other. For an example of how someone operates with this, in figure 4.2 of your textbook, you will find someone who is trying to copy basic line drawings and is almost, well, not almost, is incapable of doing so, yet they're actually able to draw those items from memory. So note that this is a specific problem with the ability to combine viewed perceptions, not the ability to combine features from memory. A different type of agnosia is associative agnosia. And this ultimately allows one to see in a normal and functioning way. It's just the ability to connect what it is that you are seeing is no longer tied to your ability to give labels to the objects that you're seeing. There's an interesting little chapter or section of your textbook right in the beginning where I believe it is taken from one of the books Oliver Sacks has written. I think the book is called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And you can see how even when presented with daily objects that we take for granted, things like cups and gloves and hats, even though they can see them and they can describe them in great detail, they're unable to tell you what those things are. And so here the problem is not so much in the visual processing itself, but that visual processing now seems to be disconnected from our existing knowledge centers. Well, let's talk a little bit about a healthy functioning human being. And a regularly functioning human being is able to recognize an incredible amount of objects. I mean, just think about all the stuff that is around your apartment. And if you live a minimalist life, even then there are probably many things that you can name in said apartment. Or you could walk down a street and have tons and tons of more things that you could easily recognize. And it's, it's not only objects, it's actions. You can see when someone is walking or taking their dog for a run, or if someone is being violent towards someone else, or if someone is being kind by giving them a cupcake. All of those actions can be recognized as well, along with situations. Just imagine being in a movie and you can quite quickly tell whether that is going to be an action movie, a horror movie, or a comedy. These are all processes of recognition. Now, one of the most interesting and fascinating things about recognition is that it seems to work even though many different items of a single category are different in appearance. Now, just think about all the cats you've seen in your life. They come in a wide variety of different colors and shapes and sizes. Well, not really that many shapes. Unfortunately, sometimes they're missing a leg or a tail or something due to some kind of accident. But for the most part, they have similar shapes, I guess. But their sizes and colors vary dramatically. And some are super fluffy and some have no hair at all. And yet all of them are easily recognized by you as a cat, which is actually pretty unbelievable if you think about it because that was one of the biggest challenges in getting computer recognition to be able to tell that many of the same thing that we say are the same are in fact the same thing. Now, words are the same. You're able to recognize a specific word, like the tons and tons that are presented here on this PowerPoint slide, and the 
formatting of that makes very little difference as to whether you can recognize it or not. I mean, there are some formats that are practically speaking impossible to read, but for the most part, if I was to capitalize all of these words or put them all in italics or bold them or make them a little bit bigger or even have them go horizontally, you would still be able to recognize those words, even though they appear different. Remember how in the last lecture we talked about even moving your head to a different place results in a different image being cast on the retina, yet this doesn't change how we perceive the world. So too in recognition, even when items are slightly different from each other, we still recognize them. Another unbelievable example of this would be human beings are human beings to you, even though other than the occasional twins you see here or there or extra pairs, you still have no trouble realizing that they're all human beings. So this process actually indicates that the recognition systems might be more complex than just comparing something to an image that you have stored somewhere. And it goes the other way too. Not only are stimuli themselves different, but our understanding and knowledge of the world will change how we perceive a certain stimulus that is presented to us. So for example, if you look at the words presented here in this little white box that's labeled figure 4.3, I'll give you a second to read it if you haven't already. Chances are most of you were able to read this as the cat without any problem whatsoever, and probably not te -sht, which would be T-A-E-C-H-T, even though both the A-H looking symbol is the same. It is identical in both places but this is not really confused. It is recognized as being the correct letter in the word to make it have sense. Now, this is an example of how our existing knowledge about words like the and cat will, excuse me, modulate how we recognize certain stimulus or stimuli that are presented to us in the world. A couple of terms to know. When we're talking about the types of processing, so we talked about two just a moment ago without really actually naming them. One is that we're aware of certain types of stimuli that are presented to us and we process them, and others are based on our existing knowledge that we use to make sense of stimuli. So bottom-up processing is a type of processing in which the sequence of mental events, your thoughts and feelings, are determined by the incoming information, what it is you are seeing or smelling or tasting and so on. And an example of this in a very simplified form would be that you could see someone eating a slice of pizza on television and then all of a sudden get the urge to eat some pizza or whatever the food happens to be. This is unfortunately very common with those who are smokers, especially those who are trying to give up smoking. They will often see an ad or someone on television light up a cigarette and all of a sudden get struck with this almost irresistible urge to go light one up themselves. And this is an example of bottom-up processing, our thoughts being directed by what is around us in the world. The opposite is top-down processing, and this is a type of processing in which the sequence of mental events is influenced by a broad pattern of knowledge or expectations. And this is, we can have relatively ambiguous stimuli and our knowledge and expectations about how the world should be will change how we interpret that information. So an simple example of this is what we saw on the previous slide, where the cat is recognized easily even though the HA symbol is ambiguous. A much more complex version of this would be something we see in social psychology, which is called the self-fulfilling prophecy. And this basically states that if you expect someone to be, let's say, mean, that you will subtly treat them in certain ways that is more likely to bring about that type of behavior from them. And when you are examining their behavior, you will look for things to prove your original point of view, as opposed to actually looking at it objectively. This is a much more complicated case of a very similar process taking place. You are looking at the world and there are lots of events that could be perceived relatively ambiguously in either direction, Yet because of one's expectations of how it will unfold, one changes what parts of that stimuli we recognize. Not to say that some people can't just be mean people, but this happens more than one might think.
So how do we recognize objects? Most objects are fairly complex things. If you look at the stuff around you, most things are not just simple rectangles or circles. Some, a lot of things have irregular shapes or are combinations of multiple different angles, colors, textures, and so forth. And so one way in which we can process these is to break them apart into their individual features. What are the colors present in the environment around us? What are the specific shapes? What types of lines and angles are there? And then when we're trying to recognize an object, we first recognize these features and then we bind these features back together and thus are able to recognize this object. This fits a little bit with when we talked about apperceptive agnosia in which you're able to perceive features but you're unable to bind them back into a unified whole, which would lead some credence to this idea. But of course, there is this problem of, well, lots of the shapes and things that we see that make up the more complex objects are themselves made up of other shapes and angles and so forth. And so one can follow the logic moving backwards and smaller and smaller and reducing this until theoretically you get to the most basic of features, things like a horizontal line or just a specific shade of yellow. And this fits very nicely with what we were talking about last lecture when we talked about certain feature detectors that are present in the visual cortex. And so one can make the assumption that those base level features are just recognized by specialized neural tissue. And then more and more complex features are simply an iterative process of combining lower order features into more and more complicated ones until unified complete holes are created. 